This is SciBite episode 47 for May 22nd, 2012. Hi everyone, you're listening to SciBy, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, now officially one year old. My name is Chris, and joining us like every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey there, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. And I'm very excited to say for the one year anniversary celebration, yes. the J-Man joins us. Hey, J-Man. That's me. Welcome hey, back. What the heck am I doing here anyway? <laughs> well, Heather's going to tell us. Heather, what are we doing this week? Today, we're going to take a look at the spaceward journey of SpaceX, ancient arthritic reptiles, Easter Island statues, bouncy exploration probes, a mousetrap IV dispenser, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Of course, uh, it's pretty exciting to have the J-Man here to celebrate the one-year yes. anniversary. Now, he has not been officially on science duty but no. uh, I have deferred. You said duty. <laughs> oh, gosh. You can tell he's still sharp, so he's going to have plenty of good commentary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm really excited this week to talk about SpaceX. This yes. is uh, something that uh, people have been listening to the last few weeks of the show. So, know that as it's progressed, yep. I've st I started actually kind of as a skeptic. And I've yeah. kind of progressed into more and more excited about it. And uh, I don't know about you guys. Were, were either of you able to stay up last night? Almost. No. No. <laughs> I like. I like was ready. I was like, it was going to be 1 a.m. my time. And I was like, yeah. I, I think I could do that. I think I could stay up just long enough and then fall asleep right afterwards. And I had my little you know, Kindle with the countdown. And then I like clicked onto it. And it was like, had been pushed back another hour. I was like, bye, Spexx. See you in the morning. Clunk. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it either. But I, I somehow ended up actually getting probably what I could have never hoped as a more better experience to the launch uh, if I had planned it any better. I went to bed. And I was listening to a podcast, but the podcast was kind of funny. It was keeping me awake. So I thought, well, I can't fall asleep to this, right? <laughs> so I grabbed- one of your own? <laughs> <laughs> no, J-Man. I... No, those aren't funny. Those are oh, not. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, oh. Those, those ones, I actually can't even listen to myself. So I would not be able to fall asleep to myself because that would just drive me totally crazy. Uh, <laughs> but it was, what it was, was it was an internet radio st uh, stream uh, on a site called uh, Soma FM. And uh, uh, you know, Cheese Bacon in the chat room actually had t turned me on to this just a couple of days earlier. And they have this one channel, and I'll, I'll play a sample from it, but they have this one channel called Mission Control. And Mission Ooh. Control is like uh, ambient music in the background that you just kind of listen to. And then they actually played NASA. You can kind of hear it there. They play NASA. Yeah. You're now 177,000 miles out over and they just play that and Aww. they just loop it in the background. Well, I thought, I thought maybe that might be something I could fall asleep to, you know, just kind of drift off in here because I have a, I have a speaker underneath my pillow that I got off uh -huh. Amazon. And uh, so I thought, all right, I'll turn this on. Well, I turned it on and all it was was just the music. And I thought, oh, go figure. I want to listen to some NASA stuff. And it's <laughs> just the music. And then they started ch uh, chiming in. And what it was is they actually cut in the real time SpaceX launch oh. broadcast over the music and they had a DJ yeah. there who would who would change the tracks when something was happening and like when they started going into the countdown he had like these cool background TikTok and they would have more oh like gosh. dramatic music and I'm just listening to it the whole night and I heard the whole launch the successful oh. thing the countdown from from 45 minutes out is when I tuned in and at 45 minutes is really when they got down to business and really started working on stuff and we're going through checklists. So yeah. the whole thing, I was just drifting out of sleep, listening to them run down their checklist. There was a couple of points where you could hear some people getting really stressed out. Like they were worried, is this something we yeah. have to hold for? Because if we go to the next threshold, we can't hold after that. And they started going back yeah. and forth like that and uh, extremely exhilarating to listen to, especially with the DJ going with the music in the background. Yeah. You'd be surprised how often in those, those holds, because there are some holds always built into a launch. They're always thinking he's like, uh, is that checked? Please tell me that's checked. Right. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The guy sounded like a little paranoid about it. I thought, uh oh. <laughs> but <laughs> well, they did find something wrong like a couple days ago. Wasn't this supposed to go off uh, like a day or two ago? On and Saturday, it yes. At uh, T minus one half second, the launch was reported. Oh, my yes. gosh. second. Whose job was it to stop it? <laughs> it was the computer. The computer oh. autoed. Oh, wow. It was Jeez. a, uh, a stuck check. What would uh, we do valve. without computers? I know, right? <laughs> it was a stuck uh, check valve. It's meant to. Uh, 
let gas through one way and then not let it go back. And it was failed. And so there was a high pressure area in one of the engines. And so the computer saw that and went, nope. And this, <laughs> not was, today. this was actually turned into sort of an interesting PR opportunity yeah. for the SpaceX company because I heard them say something to the fact to the effect of, well, we can get in there and fix it much faster than, say, NASA could because NASA would generally be working with subcontractors mm-hmm. and they would have to bring in these subcontractors and then teach them about the, the system and teach them about the problem and then have them, you know, bid to fix it. Whereas yeah. we just go in and fix it. Yeah. And there's, there's a whole bunch of like steps to go into that. You have to have one crew go in. So how many different subdivisions of people and contractors you have to come in to assess the situation, to buy what products you need, to install it, who has to have the bean counters running where? Yeah, you don't usually uh, run into just a one, one or two day delay on NASA launches. It's usually like pushed back a week or, or more. Yeah, it, it all depends. This was one of those things where they found a problem. They said, okay, quickly analyze all the data. And so they said, okay, climb up, look at it. Oh, it's a check valve. Okay, we can, ch- we can change that out. Go in right. and change it out. St- everybody step back and Well, it helps having the guys the that you know, engineered it there to also fix it. Yeah, they're all there. Yeah. Although it was funny, the, uh, I'm talking about the, uh, you know, the countdown and stuff. The guy's sounding really stressed out. If you yeah. see like... The, the camera like checking in on the mission control area you know everyone's seen you know NASA and they're all there in their suits and they don't, they've got their hair in us this one it was like jeans and t-shirts <laughs> shorts and t-shirts and they're all just kind of standing around in a room staring at their computers wow well that's corporate culture for you right yeah they're just like alright the important thing is getting this to space yeah, yeah. well and uh, they did it the, uh, they did the, the blast off happened minus 10 9 8 7 6 5 Four, three, two, one, zero. There you go. And uh, launch of the yay. SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket as NASA uh, turns to the private sector to resupply the International Space Station. Now, uh, I got to tell you, it's a little more epic with the uh, crazy music in the background and the TikTok <laughs> of the big clock. But uh, I know it's pretty epic for me. And anyway, I don't know if the internet could feel me shaking my fist and smiling in the air, even though it's you know. It's already happened hours ago. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it, I, I'm, I'm really excited about it because it, it means we're not, we're not tied to the government to get up there and do these kinds of things, and, and maybe mm-hmm. we can actually start. No, finally. instead we're just tied to big corporations. Well, yeah, it's, true. Yeah. well it, it's not outsourced to other countries or, you know, public relations. There, oh, it, it's just it could definitely be worse. I will give you that. Yeah, <laughs> I worry about it too. Uh, you know, I actually was surprised that they publicly broadcasted all of this launch stuff. Cause I would almost wonder if that would be like a corporate trade secret and they wouldn't want that out there. I, I, I didn't expect to be able to just tune into some internet radio station and hear a, a broadcast of, you know. They have to, it's a uh, dueled by uh, NASA. Okay. NASA has to be able to do all that stuff. Now, granted some of these big, larger companies, you know, these big events, they'll, uh, they'll put the live coverage out. You know, they'll show the, the rocket testing or they'll record it. But this is one of those things that even on Saturdays, they sort of had a webcast going on like, yeah. and then like the, you know, the, you know, everything happened and the abort and they're like, okay, well, let's figure out what happened. This is big enough and it's working with NASA. They're going to have to do some of this broadcasted. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Because it gives us something to, to, to listen to and watch. Uh, well, I don't yeah. think they were exactly shy about it. I mean, you've got no. uh, some links here in the show notes from uh, Elon Musk, the, the owner, right, of, of yeah. SpaceX. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he was, he was tweeting up a storm during the launch and, and all around. the. He's he looked proud, really excited. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even on uh, Saturday when it got, uh, when there was the abort, he's like, all right, uh, slight problem. This is what it was, adjusting it. Check back in a couple days. One of the things I heard in the broadcast about uh, about the 50-minute mark is actually when mm-hmm. I tuned in, the 40, 45 is when they got down to work, and they did a brief interview right before they started, and they said, okay, assuming launch goes good, what's the next point that if it doesn't happen right, it, the, the whole thing's bagged anyway? So even if launch is perfect, what, what thing can break? And they said, well, the biggest thing we're worried about, because we've only done it in the factory, is the solar deployments. Mm-hmm. And if the, if the panels don't go out, game's up. And yeah. what they now we've done it hundreds of times in the factory successfully. It's make or break it up there. And I guess they went up there and what, what yep. about five minutes after it was up there, it deployed them or something like that. It was some yeah, sort of, de- yeah. yeah, deployed just fine. About uh, nine minutes out, nine, okay. it 
separated, and then they started to deploy the solar rays and everything. Wow. And now they have to wait. They don't get to go up and make out with the space station just yet. No, not quite yet. They have to do a whole bunch of orbital checkouts um, on the 23rd. It'll de- start towards the space station. The next day, it'll sort of make a series of various tests to make sure it's it's ready. Then like they have to do all these different tests. Like, we've done all these. Okay, now we get to get a little bit closer. Now we're a mile and a half away. Then they have to wait another day. And then NASA looks at it and says, eh, okay, we think you're okay. Hmm. Step a little bit closer. So they get to get a little bit closer and then there's some communication that the space station has to do with it. And it's like one step by one step by one step. They have to make sure that everything's communicating okay. They, they've been let, they're allowed to take one step closer. Well, well red light, a lot green can light. go wrong in space. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's very hard to fix things if they do. Uh, this, yes. this, this might be re- uh, something I regret, but this is the one year anniversary of the show. Yes. So let's, let's, let's be bold. Let's say okay. a year from now, is this a freak occurrence? Like, do they, do they expend their current contract where they have like a, like a four month run with NASA or they have some sort of contract in place? Do they extend, mm-hmm. they expend that and that's all we see for the rest of 2012 or for one year from now? Or is this just the beginning and a year back from now, this, these kind of launches, these private launches will be much more commonplace and we might even see a few more companies that are doing it at that point. What do you think? Totally going to happen. They've got this. They've got other plans. There's another company that's moving forward with this. I really think this is going to be the new way. At this point, it's cheaper for NASA to pay Mm. these companies to Mm. do it rather than them to do it themselves. I think SpaceX will probably move on to something else. They seem to have big plans, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, hints about things like potentially even a trip to Mars or or Mm -hmm. asteroid mining and stuff like that. But I I could see a lot of other commercial endeavors taking up the mantle and becoming the new supply runs for the uh, International Space Station or maybe even, who knows, maybe even making another privately run space station Mm -hmm. in orbit. Yeah. I I think the only thing is it all kind of falls apart if uh, SpaceX comes back three months from now and says, boy, turns out you cannot make money doing this at all and (laughs) we are going to have to uh, make some sort of cutbacks and then they start cutting back and things start happening. Because you got to figure this is extremely expensive. So the profit margins, I I just, I don't know. I'd be curious to hear that kind of, that kind of information about that side of the business. But I hope you guys are right. Yeah. I mean, this kind of thing is very front loaded. There's a lot of infrastructure to put in place, yeah. you know, getting all that set up. And if it wasn't feasible, I mean, granted, Elon Musk has a lot of money to throw around. PayPal but dollars. He, yeah, PayPal dollars. Mm-hmm. We all put chip, uh, yep. put in a little chip of paint on that thing. Yeah, now everybody uh, knows that's where your fees went. Yep. Into but space! Still, <laughs> yeah. Just but if like it didn't real seem feasible, dollars. I don't think he'd go forward with this. Yeah. And he's a, I mean, you can love something and you can have the money to do it but you're also going to have at least a little bit of business sense to try to make sure that it can go past your bank account. Probably. I think you're well, probably Well, that's right. the thing. I, I, you know, if they do this and then they come back and say, well, that was fun. We're done. Then yeah. we know that it was too expensive and, and this, the prospects aren't there, but I don't get that impression. I, I no. feel like SpaceX is in this at least for the mid haul, if not the long haul. Oh yeah. And, and that means that other companies out there with the money to spend on this kind of stuff, on this kind of venture will take up the mantle Yeah, in, in yeah. very short time, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are already talks with these companies that they're saying, all right, based on this, I think we could get to Mars on this kind of money. Wow. Just, just, just wild guessing. That all seems early days, but I mean, let's bring well, it. Yeah. Bring it. Yeah. I'd like to see a commercially um, sponsored uh, like pseudo colony on the moon first. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a, a step along the way. I'd like to see yeah. asteroid mining, to be honest with you. Not that I don't mm-hmm. want to go to Mars super hard. It's just that uh, resources, if we, could get, if we could get more minerals and resources off asteroids and then reduce our, our drag on the uh, environment here, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. That'd be really great. Yep. I, worry I, about, I worry about aiming at Mars too quickly. I don't want our, uh, our new found private space sector to, for their uh, reach to exceed their grasp. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you're going to take it all in steps. Now, long term or midterm, uh, the ability to continue and make your own supplies in situ resource, uh, resources, it's easier, way easier on Mars than the moon. There's, there's nothing there on the moon. Ah, uh, yeah, gotcha. But, so I mean, it's something, definitely, something sustainable is more possible on Mars. Oh, completely way more sustainable. Right. But, but on the moon, you could be more reliant on, on 
quote unquote local earth supplies that you know could be made could be supply runs could be made in what three days versus yeah that's about what apollo took so yeah so that's the difference is the earth the 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 moon base could be backed up by earth pretty quickly but yeah it's not very sustainable on its own yeah but i mean it's all about steps but i mean this step is is pretty big yeah yeah and and i guess uh, it, it's our privilege that it is a U.S. company that's doing this, but it, it could be very soon any any other country doing this. And you know, I'm curious. You know, thirty, forty years from now, will we be looking back on this launch like uh, the generation before us looks back on Apollo? Is this this the, is, potentially is this the start of a hmm. new era of it space feel travel? As grand though, does it? No, well, well, it's they're not doing I mean, anything new. Right. I mean. If you're going to look back, I mean, looking at, oh my gosh, we made it to Apollo in nine years. What was the difference of yearage between Wilbur Wright flying a little plane and landing on the moon? I mean, there's that kind of a step that makes it more awe-inspiring. You know, Mm -hmm. within nine years, he said, hey, get to the moon and back. Go. Yeah. And we did. So, I mean, and that was a huge step. So, I mean, in a certain way, we may look back and see this as a great pivot point. I think so. I, I think we will, and I think uh, it'll see. It'll seem so ridiculously commonplace. Like why? Will, why would we have the citizens subsidize that? Why would we not privatize that? That seems ridiculous. I think that's the kind of perspective we'll have on it. I think. I suspect. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, it means it's a success, and that's how we all feel about it. Uh, Heather, are there any thoughts or main points you want to hit on that one? Uh, a couple little things. SpaceX actually is kind of known for tucking little things in its uh, in its launches and not telling anyone about it until it's actually after actually launched oh yeah uh, the first one was a big wheel of cheese um this one was tucked somewhere along in the second stage of the spacecraft was a little lipstick lipstick tube can size container and it contained the ashes of a little over 300 people including uh, a mercury pro- uh, program astronaut gordon cooper uh and the actor james Dehoon, scotty from star trek yeah and that'll be in orbit for about a year and people had heard that Scotty, you might have heard that Scotty was going to be up in space before. There was a couple, yep. there was another, like in 2007, there was something that. Yeah, uh, but, it was a, uh, it made it to, to brief suborbital flight. So he was in space. Yeah. But this was actually going to orbit the earth for about a year. Good for him. So there you go. You know, I find that really cool, but does anybody else feel like that could be the beginning of some sort of really bad sci-fi movie? Where like gamma rays hit yeah. the ashes and oh, yeah. they oh, crash yeah. land as zombies and oh yeah, oh, the three oh eight. It feels like yeah. I mean, it feels like <laughs> sci-fi has been warning us to not do something like this. Exactly. There's the gamma rays, oh. you know. <laughs> oh, it won't just be zombies. They'll have superpowers. Oh, thank goodness for the tone. All right, I just want to do a quick <laughs> reminder to let people know that the Jupiter signal will be out this week. And uh, the SciBite audience is uh, w- one of our top subscribers, but I just want to let you know, just in case you haven't subscribed yet, there'll be a spot in the show notes, but you can also go over to bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal because you can't stop the signal. Right? Right, guys? Nope. Yeah, I got that. You, you get can't. it? You get it? Yeah. Okay. I got it. It's All good. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's do some more news, Heather. What do you think? All right. In severely underdeveloped parts of the world, uh, conditions are pretty primitive, don't have electricity, might not have, you know, the staffing that you need in medical facilities to monitor IV fluid delivery. Okay. It's actually a little trickier than you might imagine. They'll have very specific, you know, electronic devices here. Seems but, like there'd just be an app for that. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, that's cruel. I shouldn't, I shouldn't make that joke. But it does oh, kind of seem like there I'm would so be glad you beat me to the tasteless humor on this <laughs> Oh, <one>. man. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. Oh, oh sorry. it's okay. It, it, it was kind of funny, okay, sort right, of, briefly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, enter a team of uh, Rice University freshmen doing some, you know, engineering project. And they took a mousetrap and made a better way to hydrate children in developing worlds. Wow. So, the, the project was to regulate the amount of fluid delivered to children hmm. uh, to prevent Overhydration. Mm-hmm. Now, this is because they typically have to rely upon adult-tuned IVs, right? Yeah, so it'll be uh, a lot more fluid than the children, the kids need. Ah. So it'll tend to overhydrate them. Mm. So what this did was it used, uh, it kind of had a counterbalance. So you move the counterbalance to the exact amount that you want uh, produced, you want to inject, uh, you know, how much of the bag wants to go in. 
And then once it reaches that, it balances out, it springs like the the mousetrap type spring, clamps the IV tube, and it produces no more fluids. Huh. <laughs> and you can sit there and you can like dispense it like various, uh, you can within uh, like 50 milliliters at a time. So you can say, all right, I want exactly this much. And then set it and forget it type thing. So the doctor, you know, leaves it there, walks away, and doesn't have to sit there and yeah. somebody doesn't have to watch it. Huh. And it only takes about 20 bucks to manufacture the thing. This is pretty great. So he's got a counterbalance there for the different settings. Yep. And uh, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> in the in the audio enhanced version with the visuals here, yeah, I've got a little video of it playing. And uh, mm-hmm. th- this, I'm assuming this is the kid that invented it. He must be what, 17, 16 years old? Well, they're college freshmen. Okay, like so four college freshmen. He's a young so punk. Whatever. So. Okay, nineteen, twenty, um, maybe, maybe. 14. And he's already more successful than I will ever be in my entire life. Uh, yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, seriously, these know. guys, these guys look like they're in their in their early teens. But all right, okay. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny. That's why I specifically noted noted that they were college freshmen. Young and punks. Like, oh my get gosh. off my science. Yeah. And it's yeah. funny. These kind of projects, you know, the engineering programs will say, "Hey, here's your here's your project for." Do this. Right. And occasionally, you, know, come you think up with of some great off- new approaches. Yeah, totally new approach that nobody else would think, I want to use a mousetrap to dispense IV fluid. That sounds like a great idea. Right. Yeah. Does mouse- so a mousetrap really cost 20 bucks? I've, I've uh, never actually gone out and bought one. No, it's the, the mousetrap, the, the equipment to hook it onto an IV pole. Yeah, and the little all the various Oh, the doohickeys. Pieces. Yeah. Yeah, That's all the different pieces. doohickeys all together. Yeah. Um, all the science part of that. Costs about twenty bucks. There's that's, only, how you, uh, uh, that's how you know it's not going to work in the medical field. They're going to need a way to, to to quadruple that price before they. Okay, can... add a couple of zeros. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And then and then and then you got yourself a real medical technology. Well, and then they have to come up with a whole way where you can actually go into college to get certified as a as a operator for right. that okay. technology. Right. Yeah. Okay. Maybe they well, could just bring the exterminators in, and then they could just show the guys how to use the rat the rat traps until until they get it all yeah. figured out. Uh, well, there, there's four prototypes that'll be out there in the summer, so maybe they can uh, fly out to Malawi and Lesotho and all sorts of crazy places to yeah. k- uh, test these. Right on. Well, there you go. Very good. All right, then. Moving right along, Heather, what's our next story? Arthritic ancient sea reptiles. You leave my grandmother out of this. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm so proud you waited that long to say that. <laughs> yeah, so... Straight. I know. So we all know arthritis, degenerative condition of the joints, but they've actually found it in the jaw of a plesiosaur. Wow. So about giant sea reptile, reptile lived 150 million years ago, and it's never really been seen in uh, Jurassic fossilized reptiles. But this Has lady- it been seen in, in uh, other dinosaurs of, of any type? Like just not Jurassics? I believe so, but not uh, reptiles of this time period. I think that they've seen a dinosaur, maybe a few dinosaurs with arthritis. Um, some of the larger boned creatures. I don't recall exactly when or where, but hmm. I believe there have been some. Okay. But this was a pretty big, interesting, because it, uh, its left jaw had been so eroded that the, the lower jaw was actually cocked to one side. Ow. And it probably been crooked for years. Ow. They had... Uh, Marks on the bottom jaw where the teeth had impacted. You know, while they're chomping away, you could see the the teeth marks. Oh man, poor little guy or, or big guy, I guess. Yeah, big, eight meters long. Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> big gal. One hundred and fifty million years ago. So, did this uh, Doctor Judith uh, Sassoon just? Did she just have a vision for ar- ar- arthritis, or what? What <laughs> is the story? How do you? How how and why is this studied? Do you know? Uh, a lot of times these scientists will go back and they'll look at old specimens. I mean, this was just sitting in a museum. Mm, right, right. Oh, essentially course. library of bones. Data within so, the data. Yeah. So you go back and you look and you you find something interesting that you see. And she just kind of saw this specimen and kind of intrigued her. So she looked a little bit closer and then noticed all the degenerative arthritis in it. And they could tell that it was, you know, from there they looked at it and started estimating, you know, how big was it, that it was probably an old female Hmm. uh, because of the shape of the skull and the size of the animal. And any times with this, the arthritis itself is not going to kill the creature. They can still chop. There was nothing hunting these plesiosaurs except other plesiosaurs. They were the the big dog on campus. 
So about the only thing that would happen is if the jaw broke, then they couldn't eat. Right. So they were just living in some discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. That's not so bad. Yeah. And actually, it had a fracture in it already. Hmm. So that might have been its cause of death, is that it could no longer hunt? Yeah. So that would mean no food. And then- Are there any like further reaching- um, significances to this like or did you say that this is the first time that arthritis has been found in a in a reptile of this type or a dinosaur of any kind like that or is that yeah is that why this is so significant yeah it's tracking the where arthritis hit various uh, dinosaurs and reptiles and things sort of tracking the bone structures and how how that's degenerating and so being able to track that a little bit is you being able to tell us a little bit about the bone structures needed or what might happen to mm. cause that or mm. just where it's coming from. There you go. That's now, the chat room makes a good point. That would, be, that would suck to have arthritis and an age without Excedrin. Very much so. Very yes. Very much so. All right, Heather, any other thoughts on that story? No, I don't think so. All right, well, let's uh, move right along here because I have a feeling this next story is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh. oh. Everyone else, this is why it's not so fun. Oh. Uh, Easter Island statues. We've yeah. all seen, you know, the the creepy head sticking up out of the ground. Heck yeah! And so, and some people have seen they are actually like little body statues, like in lines across around the island. But the heads sticking out of the ground. Yeah, yeah, not sure. Heads. What? They are full statues. Full statues. Yes. Like Did, they have uh, bodies. Yes. Uh, some of them thirty feet tall and weighing eighty tons. And when they excavated them, they started moving around and they're going to invade. <laughs> no, they, they didn't move around, <laughs> but the the sand and the dirt in the area did preserve them pretty well. So once they started digging down, they'd actually see uh, hieroglyphs on them. And so they could, no, petroglyphs, petroglyphs uh, ser- preserved. So they could see wow. the various things carved into them and uh, like a boat and names very specific things because they were preserved really well. So how tall were some of these things? Like with the head included, like how tall are we talking? Uh, like some of them were 30 feet high. This is so, incredible. And and how do we, how are we only now finding out about this? These I, things are not new. Yeah, actually these, there's been this group, uh, the Easter Island um, uh, statue project. That Sounds been going like on. a this bunch is, of loony conspiracy nuts. Uh, Why'd sure. they bury their statues? <laughs> that is the question. Why did they bury them? How did they, well, they didn't necessarily bury them. Uh-huh. There's been a lot of um, natural that could have occurred. Right. Yeah. There are beaches, right? Yeah. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not quite understood what was happening or why they built these or how they moved them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They that's did my a- other question is these things must have weighed like. I can't even imagine tons. They must have had to build them in a spot, right? They they must have, or at least uh, a- no. There was a there was a quarry uh, a ways away. I don't recall exactly how far, and it was uh, some evidence that they would build them there. And actually, on some of the statues, when they dug down deep enough, they're able to find uh, little rope guides. So they probably uh, what it looks like all the evidence is to is they had them uh, big logs and they kind of rolled them along the logs, mm. kind of guided them, and then propped them up from yeah, there. But- but without any sort of like, we haven't even seen any evidence of like um, pulley systems and uh, or anything like of that nature, right? Not yet. And it's all pretty much just manpower moving yeah, mine, and setting these things up. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you set the right um, angles and things, and you can move with uh, levers and such. So the not all of it has been, you know, completely figured out. But I mean, even the. You know, I mean, going back to the Egyptians, they stood statues up tall by. Yeah, we all know that the Egyptians had help from aliens. That's That's proven. That's true. Oh, why did I not remember that? Right. Um, How did that skip my mind? (laughs) I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good thing we have Jeremy on here for the one year anniversary. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Thanks, Jeremy. (laughs) Ding. Oh, yes, I'm here to contribute what I like to call not science. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's okay. There you oh go. Oh my gosh, there you go. So digging down deep enough, they were actually able to find near them also uh, evidence of human burials. Wow. Uh, 
uh, tuna vertebrae near the bottom. There was some evidence that theories that said, um, Legends of the Island, excuse me, that said that they, they paid um, people in fish to sort of move these or build these. It was sort of a, a payment system for the hard labor. And, and maybe now, they left some of their fish there at the, at the site? You know, or they, you know, they ate not the bones and they oh, had yeah. a little pile of bo- fish bones. Eat while you work, there. sure. There you go. Mm-hmm. And uh, also evidence of paint, of various carving tools. Everything from large picks to small stones being able to finish these off. Mm. Hmm. Wow. Talk so about they, a finding we, that, Do we still know that to this day, like, is there evidence to suggest what exactly these were for? Like, you mentioned that there were, was some evidence of human burials at, at the site, but was that just workers that fell down while they were putting in the, the things and fell into the, no. the pit and they were burying the, the <laughs> stones in? Or, or was this no. actually like that was the ritualistic purpose of these things? There is some evidence that there was definitely some ritualism going on. Um, some details are very vague about what happened. There are historical, you know, passed down through the uh, vo- vocal histories of these people that still, you know, some of them are still there. But a lot of the intricate de- details are not really understood or known. A mystery so, for us to keep chewing on. Yes. I mean, you, can't, you don't want all the answers. And then where's oh, the well, who back? knows? When, when we're done finding out the bottom of the bodies, maybe we'll find it's just the top of a totem pole that goes down I'd even buy that. further. I'd buy that. Maybe, yeah. Maybe so. <laughs> right, Science Heather. will be creeped out. Science will be a little <laughs> creeped out from that. Any other thoughts on that one? No, it's just interesting that I didn't... I mean, this is the fifth year of that expedition, but I never really heard or realized that there were entire statues until I saw an article about it. I was like, that definitely deserves a bring up. Very illuminating. All right, then that means it's time for the two bite news. Two bite news. What is our first story in the two bite news? Just quickly, I was ready for the two bite news song and I was frozen in mid (laughs) pose. I was like, what is this music? I decided it was I wanted to come up with something new, so I uh, I went. Okay. Well, it was it was good. I was just confused momentarily. That if anybody could ever place that, they would ve- they would win something special. I don't know what. Okay. But something special. Okay. Moving on to a swarm of exploring rover spacecraft. Oh. So, an alternative that somebody's come up with to traditional rovers, and you know where you land it, and that's where you are, or you roll around. Sure. You drive around, and that's what it is. So another idea is to have sort of a mother. Uh, mothership and have a whole bunch of these little probes that you drop onto an asteroid or something else wait a minute wait a minute Uh uh-huh a mothership (laughs) wasn't the last rover wasn't the last rover that we sent to mars equipped with a a high intensity laser and a jet pack yes i mean and now we want to release a swarm of these robotic rovers Controlled by a mothership? Does, <laughs> am I the only one on well, this Well, don't worry. Here? I'm sure the mothership's totally automated, computer-controlled with no human intervention. So what could go wrong? Codename Skynet. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm sure it has, you know, the laws of robotics built into it. Oh, of course. Right. Of course. Because that Why never not? goes wrong. That never goes no, wrong. No, never, never, never. <laughs> <laughs> so these would be more of like... Uh, Sort of, is this more akin to like when they dropped uh, the Mars rovers and they bounced into position? These would sort of bounce along and take data while they while they explored, or would they sort of yeah. drop and stick? Because the picture here is, makes them look like they're very spiky, like they would. Well, this is a very very no, conceptual picture. <laughs> very conceptual picture. Yes. Okay. <laughs> very. Um, you know, the idea is to kind of you know you have you know one ship that kind of pours out a. Ugh, you know, however many of these you want. And then they a just swarm kind of, of robots covered in spikes. Right. Mm, go on. Uh huh. So they bounce around and they spread around. And then you have all these little, you know, spacecraft or rovers or whatever they are uh-huh. scattered about. We just call them drones. Okay, drones. So you drop them all. The- <laughs> <laughs> so you drop all of these and they scatter about. And then you don't have to worry about placing one each individually yeah. in different locations. Yeah. So it's just like a. A different idea in order to scatter them around. Um, I've also heard like, you know, you have uh, for Mars, maybe an idea would be to put a little rover, you know, in between, you know, a, on, somehow on a wheeled pulley system and then just have a little balloon above it so that the winds pull uh, you all around. Huh. 
and you just kind of scoot around by the winds and you just, you know, record your data and signal it up from well, there. Hasn't, hasn't part of the goal of the previous rovers been to study very specific things at yes. uh, near their landing sites? So what would be the point of having this? It seems kind of slapdash, kind of like, you know, you just get what you get. Um, it doesn't seem like anybody would really buy into that in the scientific community that they'd just this, be. Which one? The, uh, the idea of just like floating around, you, you end up where you end up. You study what you see, whatever. It sounds kind very, of inaccurate. They're various. Yeah. No, they're it very. It doesn't sound sciencey. <laughs> well, these are studying specific. The ones we sent up studying specific locations. This is an interesting area that we want to study very closely. Or this is an area that we think humans might land at in the sometime in the future. We want to look specifically at it. But even the rovers drove around quite a bit. Mm. If you want to have a more widespread analysis of something, it's not going to be as detailed. I guess no, it'd also probably be circumstances where it'd be because the article talked about how they'd build a lot of these at cheap prices mm -hmm. and then distribute yeah. them, so you could get like a re a, a whole series of pictures from a bunch of different angles mm -hmm. from a region, which would probably be pretty useful. Yeah, the swarm. I mean, it would be useful on you know asteroids even. So you go up to an asteroid, dump a whole bunch of these out, and see, get a quick. Mm. So you can seriously. Get am I the only person freaked out by calling these the swarm? <laughs> well, no, I mean, <laughs> as long as they don't use them here, keep them up in space. Keep them up in space. We'll Although, just manufacture them cheaply using secondhand AI. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, because they won't have an inferiority complex that'll, you know, doom us all. Right. Oh, well, this next story you have here, should we, ch should we chat about this? Because it reminds me yeah. of my childhood, where yeah. good old Carl Sagan and his Cosmos series. And yes. What's going on with this story? Because it sounds like maybe it's coming back in some sense. Yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson, which uh, some people know as the Pluto killer. Um, right, kind of yeah. how he made his name. Yeah, kind of how he made his name. Is actually cooking up with Seth MacFarlane. The family guy. Uh, the family guy person, yeah, yes. Yeah. And they're working to have a return of Cosmos. I saw the name of this, the title of this article, and it was like, Family Guy creator to bring back Cosmos. And right. I was like, is it April 1st? What? Uh, <laughs> I don't get it. You know, I, 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 from the interviews I've seen with him, I bet he just loved the Carl Sagan series yeah. a lot. He is yeah, a gigantic like, nerd. Oh, yeah. I mean, in a good way. In, yeah. in a good way. Well, yeah. well, you know, who are we to judge on SciBite? What do you guys sure. think? Can, you, can, you, can it be the same? It's it, not going to be the same. No, but I think... I think, I think, well, hmm. I think Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson is a good choice, though, for it. Yeah. I've, I've seen many interviews with him, and, yeah. and uh -huh. he's really... He's, he's one of these guys that can take science down to earth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, literally and figuratively. And speak sort of literally. inspirationally too, which is a really good, you know, which, which yeah. that is great for that particular type of. And he just cuts through the BS. He gets right to the mm -hmm. point of things and really just makes, it, he actually takes some highbrow concepts of science and is able to speak to them in common sense terminology. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That I think is exactly what Cosmos really did for, for our generation True. in many ways. It, it brought these. Mm -hmm these really highbrow theoretical concepts into our, into our, the forefront of our minds in ways that were easier to think about mm -hmm. than, you know, reading textbooks and such. And visualize like the calendar, yeah. the calendar mm -hmm. to represent the universe that hold existence of the universe and all of that. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very awesome. So it, yeah. So it's one of those times where someone with the right money, with a specific interest, no matter how, how oddly it seems at first can really bring something back like this. And it was just kind of, Seth yeah, MacFarlane, like you know, his success with Family Guy and uh, American Dad has really put him into, uh, I bet he has a lot of clout, basically, yeah. with networks and things like that. He can probably push through a personal project like this. Well, and I'm sure he mm -hmm. owns his production company at this point, too. So he's got yeah. all of that end of it taken mm -hmm. care of, too. Mm -hmm. it's, a great, it's, a great, it's a great, when you think about it from that standpoint, it's a real great matchup. Right. Yeah. So. And it's, I mean, Elon Musk, he made a whole bunch of money with PayPal. And he said, you know what? Space is cool. Yeah. Let's yeah. go there. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, it's you worked know, out so far. I have this. Yeah. Uh, I have this red flashing dot here on the Cybite computer. I only okay. use this. This computer is custom built just for Cybite. So if this okay. red light is flashing, I should. <laughs> ah, of course. I can't yeah. wait till they upgrade these computers. But I can tell you by those beeps and tones that it is time for the spacecraft update. Yes. Poor Jeremy was worried about it early. Our laser-induced robot Curiosity rover. 75 days till touchdown. Oh, wow. I'm very How long excited. is that until he engages his uh, jetpack? 75 then, days. 
Is yeah. that 75 days? You got to use it yep. to get to land. Yeah. All right. Yep. Comes in, jetpack, you know, laser Ironic ready. that this is landing in 2012. No, I'll, I'll stay off that. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you listen to uh, Cybide 46 from last week, you'll realize that the Mayan calendar does not end in 2012. It actually goes 7,000 years further. And actually, if you really calculate, they never counted in leap years, so it actually would have ended like yeah. a couple years ago. So That's okay. the bummer part. That's the bummer part right there. Is they didn't count leap year because you know what? We made up leap year. That was our thing. Well, not yeah. our thing, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Later generations thing. Uh, yeah. Chat room, if anyone in the chat room can do quick math and tell me what episode of Sidebite will be on. This is 47 right now. And in mm-hmm. 73 days or 75 days when we're talking about this, I want to know what episode we're at. All right. <clears throat> now. That's 10 weeks. This is going to be a little snug. Jeremy, if you step, don't me, then Jeremy, it's like episode 57. This, uh, this uh, time machine is only, only built for two, but here, step Uh-oh. in the time machine with us, Jeremy. Right. Here we go. All right. Come on. Close the door. Close the door. <laughs> Somebody's gonna fall out. Oh, well, I think we're gonna have to leave J Man slippers in in the (laughs) present. Uh, All right, our first destination in the time machine this week is 93 years ago, May 29th, 1919. What happened, Heather? Einstein's theory of relativity was proved. A solar eclipse was actually uh, permitted some observations of the bending of starlight. They're able to, you know, the eclipse enabled to look at a star and kind of see the light bent just slightly. So able to see that the sun's gravitational field was was affecting uh, the star's light as predicted by the theory of relativity. Wow. There you go, Einstein. You finally got your uh, your recognition because you were so... Dis- wait, wait. No, wait a minute. What do you that mean was during just- his lifetime. Oh, 93 years ago. 93 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. I know, yeah. I know. All right. Uh, our next destination takes us to 51 years ago, May 25th, 1961. I believe in this nation should commit itself to achieving before this decade is out, landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Yeah, that was my terrible impression. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> Kennedy had almost like a British accent. Almost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had no idea what it was going. Was I doing believe that in this nation should commit it. No, I can't do it either. You just get a sound bite. Dude. Just get out. a sound bite. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. There, there is a sound bite in yeah. there. Oh, yeah. That's what, <laughs> there is a oh, sound bite. How horrible is that? that oh, Heather, I sh- I'm sorry. It's okay. It's uh, okay. Wait, should I try it? Uh, win the battle. Uh, that is now going on around the world. It's actually not as bad as I remember. Freedom. Hey, the national decisions are marshaled, the national resources. His accent isn't as thick as I actually kind of, for some reason, remember it. All right. You're remembering uh, Mayor Quimby. Yeah, <laughs> I think oh, you're gosh. right. All right. Our, uh, our next destination just takes us to one year ago, May 25th, 2012. What that happened? Was- that was when the first Cybite was posted on Jupiter Broadcasting, which you wow. should totally check out. Is it so? Yeah, that's uh, that's the I'm episode. In that. of, yeah, it's about yeah. gravity. I remember that episode, episode one about gravity. It was twenty one minutes long. Uh, so uh, not 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 that long. Although, and if uh, I rem- if I recall correctly, it was actually like three weeks in post production because I was a big old lazy j- jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that specifically. I don't even remember uh, that. (laughs) We shot the episode before we had chosen our theme music. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, We were still working on titles and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We're listening through all the the various clips and going, all right, this is going to be stuck here for a while. What am I going to pick? I don't know if uh, Heather's ever gotten full credit for that, but that was her choice. So, so that the awesome music. theme music, that I love it. Yeah, and it, yeah. it was actually uh, that was her suggestion. Nice, Heather. Good pick. Props. Yay. Good pick. Yeah, and uh, so there you go. One year ago. So that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. All right. Well, uh, with uh, the time machine all done with, that means it's time for us to look up into the sky this week. Yep. Uh, some of you may have gotten to see the annular solar eclipse from Sunday. No, you did. Uh, I'm not jealous. I did. I, oh, I you guys had, uh, what do they call clouds. those things? Clouds. Clouds. Oh, yeah, they don't make those here in California. Oh, man. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, so, I had one of my coworkers was able to peek through some of the clouds. If he stood on his roof, looking between two houses uh, with the welding goggles, they could kind of peek and see part of it. And he was really happy and proud that he could <laughs> well there were definitely some incredible images posted online oh, i mean yeah. and video and all that kind of stuff so i didn't feel like i was totally left in the dark oh but um bump but no. uh, i i uh i was definitely a little bummed the cloud coverage was so thick that you couldn't even yeah. see the light from it yeah but I'll there tell you, are... it was really cool here oh yeah it was weird though i mean like uh imagine the light of like a dusk when the when the when the sun is just starting to go down 
mm-hmm. you know, and, and the sky gets all kind of hazy and, yeah. and, and, mm-hmm. and orangish, but not like pink yet. Yeah, yeah. But the shadows were all wrong. Yeah. Like and that's the, the thing the that day. really messed with my head because like uh, we were looking at sunset like light, but all the shadows were still, you know, the, the sun was still up in the sky. Mm-hmm. So weird. Oh, I wish I, I, I did seen not that. come. I did not come prepared though. I, I, my girlfriend and I held up like four pairs of sunglasses stacked on top no, of each other to try that. to get a glimpse. <laughs> no, no, we no. were only able to glance for like a half a second. No, like, no. Oh, oh, Sci-fi cool. does not uh, suggest you ever, ever. Well, that's do why that. this is an audio show now because I, I can't do video and right. I'm uh, okay. able to see it. If you're ever <laughs> in a bind, don't have anything else. Find a piece of paper or a cardboard. Poke a pinhole in it. Shine it on a piece of paper or on the cement. What if I have really buff eyes? Like my eyes are buff. Totally. No, don't. Because because no. your eyes won't be totally buff afterwards. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Actually, we oh. covered that in a previous episode of SciBite. We yeah. <laughs> Way have. back in the day, we talked about the effects of sunlight on the internal parts of your eye. Oh, wow. Which, if you didn't pay attention to that, you're glad that we're audio only now. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. you couldn't enjoy all the, the awesome visuals in our uh, enhanced enhanced audio speaking of which heather has a bunch of really great ones for the uh for the eclipse so if you want to go uh, watch your son porn check out the links heather has in the show notes a couple of the really interesting ones are ones from space probes or looking down on earth seeing that the shadow Ooh. on the earth like in the middle you know there's a big lit globe and then there's like a little shadow in the middle of it which is really cool oh i wonder and then uh, earth and space is the highlight eclipse highlights from earth and space that one is that the right one i think it may be uh, annual or solar eclipse cast oh, a shadow on Earth. I'll check those out. I'll have to check those out. That looks really awesome. Yeah, and then one other thing is, uh, you know, the pinhole is what I was speaking about. Mm-hmm. It actually shows through uh, trees. You know, you have this uh, spotted light through trees. You can actually see the little uh, eclipses through trees like that. So you see like a whole bunch of these little annular eclipses, and there's one image of uh, yeah you know, against a a brick, that sounds killer, a cement wall, or like shining on like a little bird it's a bird sitting in there and there's an eclip- a whole bunch of little eclipses shining onto it it is actually kind of creepy that when i saw it i don't know if when i saw it uh, the the ring solar eclipses to me they look like something from a from a scary movie <laughs> uh, well we've already was- talked about the robot apocalypse today and zombies from space okay. so we might as co- well cover something occultish with the oh, okay. uh, with the eclipse, <laughs> yeah, actually, one of my favorite pictures of of the eclipse was subtitled something about a a fire demon attacking because it was taken in a part of the world where the sun was right over the mountains and all you oh, could see was these little uh, uh, crescents, two little mm-hmm. crescents peeking up, peeking up over the side, and it looked like devil horns or something peeking oh, up over gosh. the side of a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a pretty fun event, and then of course I talked to somebody today and they said, "Oh, I didn't even know that was going on. I didn't even." Like, oh man, you should have been listening to Sidebite because yeah, I know. Heather's, Heather's been warning people about it. <laughs> All right, well, now that's the eclipse. But what about this upcoming week? What do we got? All right. We're going to see day by day the moon marching up its way up away from the sun as Venus is moving closer towards the sun as we uh, prepare for our, I believe, June 6th upcoming of the Venus transit. So we got that going on. Uh, it's going to be dropping lower and lower. Um, you know, in the west northwest, preparing for that. Mars is actually high in the south southwest sky later in the evenings. Mm. Jupiter, our favorite planet, except for Mars, of well, course, yeah, yeah. is uh, going to be only barely visible in the at sunrise. Okay. And uh, Saturn is going to be high in the south after dark. There's actually going to be a really bright star near it, uh, Spica. It's going to be about five degrees, which is three fingers at arm's length. Um, to Saturn's lower right. Uh, so it's going to start off, the star is going to be lower right of Saturn. And as the night goes on, it's going to go to directly below. So the upper one, the higher one, is going to be Saturn. Okay, higher one will be Saturn. So there you go, folks. And of course, if you see these things, you're like, oh, what was it Heather said? What was it? She, she, she wrote it all down in the show notes. So just go check those. Yep. Uh, and you can, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. And I, I swear I've watched people do it too. I, I see return visitors, they go down, that's what they look at. Like, okay, I got it, I got it. <laughs> Like, okay, right. that's what I saw. Now I can look all cool for everybody else. Well, I think that's the whole show right there, right? I think so. Well, congratulations on the one year, Mark Heather and J-Man. Yeah. Thank you for joining well, us um, tonight. Yeah. I do want to say, you guys, it's really great. You know, I, I, I helped start SciBite, but I'm so glad that it has become this like actual professional thing after I left. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are about it. Was so, you I love listening to SciBite still. I mean, back I, in the day. 
I'll, I'll be honest. I, I will go ahead and admit that I don't catch every episode, but when I get to listen to Cybite, I, I really enjoy it. Great. You guys have turned this into a really great show. Well, thanks, Jay, man. And yeah, uh, thank you, Heather, for the one year of unbelievable hard work. I know you work a ton on this uh, every week, Heather, so thank you for all your hard work. And a, uh, All for science. All for science. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Cybite. If you'd like to participate live when we record this one and join us in our chat room, you can do that over at jblive.tv, Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. And of course, this episode releases usually just a couple hours after that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and you can subscribe to get the show weekly in just about any format you like. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>